Hey, welcome back. The agenda for this video is to discuss the output impedance of the Wilson current mirror. This was quite popular in the BJT era, but is now obsolete in the CMOS era. Primarily because it requires a minimum output voltage of VGS plus VDSAT, which can be quite large, especially as supply voltages are scaling down to 1 volts and below. Nonetheless, it possesses an interesting negative feedback and thus it is instructive to look at its impedance computation. Also, I asked this interesting question on LinkedIn and also here on YouTube. I discuss related to it towards the end of the video. So make sure you watch till the end. The general idea behind current mirrors is that if two identical transistors have the same VGS and VDS, then the same value of current would flow through them. VGS is generally made the same by tying the gates together and the cascodes serve the purpose of equalizing the drain voltages for both the primary current mirroring transistors. In the Wilson current mirror, suppose that the drain voltage of M2 increases above that of M1. The diode connection would cause the gate of M3 to go up. M3 would then act as a common source amplifier and would pull the source of M4 down. M4 is an interesting transistor since it is biased with an ideal current source which makes the VGS of M4 a constant, meaning the small signal VGS of M4 is zero. So if the source voltage of M4 goes down, so does its gate voltage. And finally, if the gate voltage of M1 goes down, then so does its source voltage as it is a source follower. So the negative feedback in this topology restores the drain voltage of M2. Also, the drain voltage relation for M2 and M3 can be expressed as VD2 plus VGS of M1 minus VGS of M4 is equal to VD3, which is the drain voltage of M3. VGS1 minus VGS2 is approximately zero. So that's how the system equalizes the potential difference between the drains of M2 and M3. The output impedance can be computed by drawing the small signal model and writing the equations for KVL and KCL. However, that would be a bit cumbersome for my liking. Let's see if there's an easier way. And can we actually use the results of what we already know to make our life easier? We just saw that the system has a negative feedback and M3 serves as a common source amplifier. Visually, for the purpose of the output impedance calculation, the system can be depicted as M1 with some resistance at its source node. And then you have an amplifier with a negative gain from the source of M1 to its gate. Does this ring any bell? It looks quite like what is popularly known as gain boosting. I made a video on it previously. I believe that it's a very important concept to be aware of. You guys can check that out. If you have watched that video, then you would know that the output impedance of such systems can be conveniently expressed as A plus 1 times GM1 RO1 plus RO1 plus RS. Here RS is the looking down impedance from the source of M1, which is approximately 1 over GM2. Note that RS is the looking down impedance and not the total impedance at the source of M2. The total impedance would be much lower because of the negative feedback in place. A is the magnitude of the gain of the amplifier. It is GM3 times RO3 in our case. Why? Because looking up from M3 into the source of M4, the low frequency impedance is actually infinite and not 1 by GM4 if you take IREF as an ideal current source. Since IREF is ideal, no small signal current can flow through M4. That makes the total impedance at the drain of M3 as RO3. And thus, its gain is minus GM3 times RO3. Plugging in these values, the output impedance of the Wilson current mirror can be expressed as RO1 times 1 plus GM1 GM3 RO3 over GM2 plus GM1 over GM2. This is the order of GM RO square just like a traditional cascode. So the main takeaway from this should be to identify the kind of feedback in a system, how it is helping, and then recognizing the blocks that we are already familiar with so that we can utilize our previous learnings to make our life as circuit designers much easier. 
By the way, if you feel that I can help you in your journey in the realm of semiconductors, you can connect with me on TopMate. Several folks have been doing so and have given wonderful feedback as well. Great. So as promised, let's look at the poll that I had conducted. Majority of the viewers voted that the worst case corner of a circuit occurs either in the strong or the weak corner. Well, that's not quite true. It depends upon the performance metric that we are interested in and also on the circuit topology. For example, if someone is interested in the switching threshold of a CMOS inverter and they wanted to be in the middle of the supply voltage range, the worst case would be when the PMOS is strong and the NMOS is weak or when the NMOS is strong and the PMOS is weak, that is in the skew corners. Depending upon the circuit topology, the VDS minus VDSAT margins can also be affected in the skew corners, putting certain transistors out of saturation and thus disrupting the intended, intended performance. I feel that it is imperative to simulate your circuit in the skew corners as well before progressing to the statistical simulations. Hope you guys liked today's discussion. Make sure to smash the like button if you did and you may check out these videos next. Happy learning!